So, welcome to this talk. This talk is about AGDE. What's new in AGDE? Getting extra performance out of your game using Pogo, that's Profile Guided Optimization. And actually, this is a bit of a bait and switch. The majority of this talk is about QA testing and automation. And please don't run out of the doors. I promise you, it, you will enjoy it. I know that's weird, but you really will. Anyway, we'll get to that. I'm Simon Cook. I have a cold. It's just a boring old cold. I've checked twice at this point, but I apologize for my voice is a bit lumpy by the end of this talk. Uh, I'm an engineer over in the Android Games Developer Relations team. You might have seen me around the industry for a while. I've been teaching game devs how to use game-related technology for a decade, uh, mainly focusing on performance optimization. And I've shipped a few games myself and helped hundreds of other developers ship their games. So what's new this year in AGDE? Now, if you're looking at this slide, what you might actually be thinking is, what's AGDE? So let me get you up to speed if you don't know. AGDE is the Android game development extension for Visual Studio. It's a free extension for Visual Studio, first released in November 2019, and it's under active development. It integrates Android build support, debugging support, and more into Visual Studio. So if you are already developing native C++ games in Visual Studio, uh, then it will make it easier for you to develop them for Android. And we want your feedback. Please send us emails and let us know. And I'll bring that uh, email back up at the end of the talk. I'll also bring this slide up again at the end of the talk, so don't go grabbing your cell phone just yet. But uh, you can download it from here. So what's new in AGDE this year? Well, we've got developer workflow improvements. One of the things that we've changed is it now runs side by side with Android Studio, uh, Flamingo or later, and I think currently we're on Electric Eel, and the canary build is Giraffe, uh, without ADB conflicts. So previously, you'd have problems if you tried to open both of them. They tried to talk to your device at the same time. Uh, we fixed that in the current version. Uh, we've also added support for the Ninja Build system. This gives you the ability to easily open your project in both Android Studio and Visual Studio, and it allows you to use Android Studio for the specific tasks where it shines while keeping Visual Studio as your primary IDE. Now, that includes if you're doing heavy Java, Kotlin, or GNI development, you might want to do that in Visual Studio instead of, uh, in Android Studio instead of Visual Studio. Uh, if you're doing Java and C++ mixed mode development, uh, debugging, where you're bouncing between the two, uh, you probably want to do that in Android Studio at this time. And if you're doing any heavy work, working on your Gradle build, uh, if you want to edit it, upgrade it, or even analyze where the slow spots are in it, Android Studio has tools built in for that. So it's a good reason to switch that. The other reason to use Ninja is because it gives you much faster builds. Ninja, as a backend for CMake, increases parallelism and allows your build times to be a lot shorter in many cases. So, what else are we adding? We're adding support for native memory corruption debugger, uh, debugging with address sanitizer and hardware address sanitizer. Now, these tools are compiled into your code, and they allow you to analyze usually hard to debug memory corruption issues, for example, stack and heap buffer underflows, uh, double freeze, wild freeze, things like that. Now, the thing with address sanitizer is it's quite heavyweight. It will cost about two, it will make your code about two times slower if you use that. Luckily, hardware address sanitizer doesn't have quite the same impact on your code. There's still a cost, it's much smaller, but it does require a special build of the OS to be installed on your phone. If you've got a Pixel device, you can find that on ci.android.com, and for other devices, talk to your manufacturer to get access to that. Another thing that we've added is debugging and monitoring improvements. For example, we've integrated Android Studio's new Logcat window, which offers filtering and highlighting and multiple tabs. And now you can access that from Visual Studio. And, and here's probably the meaty feature that we want to talk about in this talk. Uh, we've added instrumented profile guided optimization support, or instrumented POGO. 
What this does is it allows you to take your code and tune it and optimize it based on its real world usage patterns, based on profiling your game as a normal player runs through it. It requires good code coverage to get the most benefit out of it and building instrumented libraries for the best results, uh, but it does fall back to normal compiler optimization behavior if there's no data to figure out what the best thing to do would be. Usually it translates to 5% or more improvement in CPU cost. That's a very conservative figure. I didn't want to give one better than that because I don't want to set up false expectations. It does vary a lot based on your specific game code. And it's for free, for certain values of free, with a very large asterisk there. Because in some cases, to get the most out of this, you're actually going to have to do some work. Um, however, the way that Pogo works normally, you don't have to change the algorithms in your code. It's just going to make things run faster. Okay? And if you have to, you can add, manually add it to your build if you need to. If you have your own build system and you're using uh, Clang and LLVM, there are compiler switches that you can add to your build to enable this yourself. Uh, but we've made it the easy mode uh, way of doing it for AGDE. So when you're doing this in practice, what does this look like? What's the process? So first you make yourself an instrumented build and when you do that, the compiler will automatically add counters to measure your code. Uh, then you collect profile data, you run your instrumented build, and get as much coverage as you can running through as many different scenarios as you can. At the end of those playthroughs, the, uh, instrument, uh, the instrumented code will dump that file out to disk. And then, if you're doing multiple runs and you have a QA team who are working on this, you'll be able to merge those profiles together so that you don't have to have um, all of it happen in one go through your game. So you could have different people testing different levels, generating different profile data. And then finally, you take all of this data that you've collected and you provide that to the compiler to perform a profile guided build. So let's go into a little bit of detail about what an instrumented build actually is. I'm just going to take a sip of water. So an instrumented build takes your code and it compiles counters into your code to collect data as it runs. And these counters get added to the entry and exit of your functions. And for any different code blocks, at the entry point of a code block within a function, a counter is also added there. So for example, if you had an if else branch, then at the top of the code for the if part of the branch, a counter would get added, and when your code enters that, it will tick up. And at the beginning of the else branch, another counter will get added, and that will tick up if your code enters the else count. If you add all of this together, you can figure out how many times your code went down the different paths of execution, so we can figure out which ones are the most important. Now, other data might also be collected as well. For example, if you're calling memcopy a lot, and generally we try to avoid doing memcopies in games, but if you're calling memcopy a lot in the middle of a function, then we will record what size all of those memcopy operations were. And so based on that, we might generate an inline version. If we see that you're always doing the same size over and over again, we might have an inline version of that operation in pure assembly code injected into your function in place of the memcopy operation and put the normal memcopy on a side path as a fallback case, just in case your code doesn't behave the way you'd expect. Finally, data gets written out at the end of a run. Uh, usually, when we do this kind of data recording in PGO and LLVM, whenever your executable exits normally, that data gets written out to disk. Now, on Android, no process exits normally. They're all terminated when they finish running. You get an event first, but we just kill the process. So you have to call this yourself at an appropriate time in your game that isn't performance sensitive. So usually that would be when you're leaving a scene or from a pause menu or something like that. Now, one thing to bear in mind with the profile data that the instrumented profiler captures is that this data actually survives pretty well across builds. 
You might not expect it because you know, you're changing the code, which changes the things that are being instrumented. But as long as the changes are minor, the majority of that profile data is still going to survive from check-in to check-in and still be useful. So you don't have to toss out your profile data for every single change that you check in. Eventually, you're going to want to, but you don't have to do it each time. Now, for all of this, what do you get out the other side? Well, with this information, the compiler can make better judgments about what to do to your code. Now, without this information, it's just going to use a bunch of heuristics and try to figure out from static analysis what it should do when generating that output. But with this information, it can do a better job of loop vectorization. As we've already mentioned with memcopy, it can convert some of your library calls to intrinsic uh, or inline assembly. We've also got hot path optimization. This is where Pogo really shines. So it can do better branch layout, and you don't have to mark each of the legs of the branch with likely or unlikely attributes to get the benefit of that, because it will measure that and can use that information directly. It will make better decision making on when to and when not to inline functions, which is great, because you're inlining code that is very rarely executed. It's just going to mess up with your instruction cache utilization and slow everything down, because you're accessing memory way more often. And Related to that, it's going to co-locate code together on the common path and put commonly co called functions together in your executable, which also reduces instruction TLB misses, which are a huge penalty as well, because it's going to go off to main memory to read those page tables back in whenever it accesses them. So basically, the upshot of all of this is you get way better instruction cache efficiency and way better instruction TLB utilization. It'll also make better choices about register allocation and when to spill registers to the stack, because now it knows exactly which path it's going to go down. It doesn't need to save off registers. It's not going to touch. And also, one huge benefit of this is that code should run better on in-order execution units. If you ever did any PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360 programming, on the PowerPC, you know all about dealing with in-order execution processes. Um, on most SOCs on phones today, the small and medium cores, they are in-order execution units. On the large cores, they're out-of-order execution units. And this will make your code function better on those smaller cores. And there's other optimizations in there as well. They may change over time as LLVM keeps adding more and more features. Now, this all sounds a bit expensive and potentially slow, because every now and then in your code, you're just atomically incrementing a counter as you go into it over and over and over again. And depending on your game, you might be fine. So if you're not CPU bound, you'll probably be OK. Uh, if you're not targeting ultra high refresh rates, like 120 hertz, you'll probably be fine, because you've got more overhead. Um, but it is quite possible that the added overhead of added in adding instrumented profiling to your game will be too much for your game to handle and remain playable. So you've got a couple of choices here. You can use your existing unit tests to generate test data for profiling if you want to, uh, although be cautious because the error and API fuzzing test cases that you have those aren't the ones you want to train your compiler on, because now you're training for all of the error cases. right? So you don't want to do that. Uh, but if you're training it on just like the stuff you'd normally run as smoke test, that should be fine. Um, however, the best solution is going to be to create an input recording system. And if you don't have one, I'm going to explain the basics of how to build one and why you want one. So before we go any further, what is a semi-deterministic replay? So the basic idea behind semi-deterministic replays is that you start your game at a known starting point. This could be a test level that you've developed for testing out different game mechanics and systems in your game. Or it could be a save game that you've handed out to your QA team. Then you put your game into an input recording mode when you load this, and you record the controller input along with the frame number. If you're doing a multiplayer game, you can also record all of the packets that would come in over the network, 
and use that to simulate the activity of a network run through. Now, then, once you've got all this information, you start writing it out to a ring buffer. Although, honestly, you might not need to because this information is going to be pretty sparse and pretty small. Uh, but if you need to, you can just flush as needed. Ideally, you flush at the end of the session so that you don't interrupt normal gameplay. And here's the thing. It really doesn't need to be ultra deterministic. Um, you don't need perfect replays. The only thing you have to be able to do is make sure that your input recording doesn't lose sync with your gameplay simulation and that it goes through the same way each time. That way, you know that you're not going to end up in an edge case where the player recording goes off and tries to do something and goes off into the weeds doing something else because it lost sync. Most games have input as part of their main simulation loop, so this is very feasible for the majority of them. Now, when you come to replay your input, it goes something like this. You start your instrumented game in input playback mode, and that probably means that you're going to set a fixed time step at your target frame rate for example, you could use this for overnight profiling and regression testing for your game. So you can do profiling operations on these recordings that you've already taken for your own use to make sure that nobody's checking in uh, slow code. Now, as part of that, you might disable VSync. You can maybe put your device into fixed performance mode this is in Android 13 or later, and in Android 12 on Pixel devices. Uh, there's the shell command there, ADB shell command power set fixed performance mode enabled true. And that will put your phone into a mode where the CPU cores are not going to be allowed to uh, increase and decrease in clock speed, same with the GPU. Uh, and it's going to be kept um, as high a clock speed as possible without hitting thermal throttling on your device. So that's good for doing more deterministic profiling. Uh, you should also disable network multiplayer because your multiplayer event's going to come from your recording. And disable any ads, especially if you were, say, going to take these and put them up on Firebase and do some testing of your game there using these recordings uh, because you can't have ads in your game if it's testing on Firebase. And uh, their behavior can vary a lot. Certain ads will require you click in a certain place to get out of them, for example. Uh, you can also then load the starting point that matches the input recording you have and stream out the events one at a time in lockstep with your frame counter as if they were real game input. So, okay, I know nobody really wants to work on automation when you could be working on your game. And getting your game out of the door is the most important thing that you can do. But this is the kind of thing that you will see the benefits from over and over and over again as you do development. If you're assuming that you're only going to ship one game, maybe don't do this. But if you're planning on being around for the long haul, the investment that you put into doing this is going to pay you back over and over again over time. Why? Because it allows you to force multiply your QA team's work. So if you can take an input recording of one tester, you can now increase your test coverage on all of the different devices that you have because that one recording will now play back on every one of those devices and your tester doesn't have to then test on every single one of them. They can just focus on testing more of your game and getting through more coverage of that game and making a better game. Similarly, if you have produced builds of your game that you can then upload to a mobile test lab in the cloud, like Firebase, and there are other solutions out there as well, um, you've now got access to even more devices for testing than you could necessarily get in your own studio. It will also, if you build this into your continuous integration uh, build system, it will allow you to catch bad content as it's checked in, because you'll see performance drops on a real-world playthrough of your game if you generate reporting from this. You can also catch bad code check-ins overnight before they become a larger problem. 
And the final benefit, which is always the thing that annoys testers more than anything else, is you will reduce the number of times that they go to an engineer with a problem and the engineer comes back and says, ah, I couldn't re reproduce this at all. There's no way I can get that to happen. Uh, come back to me when you can show it me on my machine. Because now they have a recording that has exactly everything that the individual tester did that they can play back. And if it's a really hard to catch bug, they can play that back a thousand times until it happens right there on their device. So this is a bit of an eye chart slide, so I apologize for that. But this is all of the kind of things that you can get by building out this system. So starting from recording a simple input file where you've recorded all of the actions of this uh, tester, you now build a library of those recordings. You get in green the benefits of the uh, easier bug repros for your engineers. You can also fan this out now to do all kinds of local testing, online testing, overnight testing within your studio. And you still get the additional benefits of profile guided optimization, even if turning on instrumentation causes problems for your game. So is this a lot of work? Yes, potentially. Uh, honestly, I don't think it's a tremendous amount of work. Most large studios have this already. Epic have it, Bungie have this. Um, pretty sure that Ubisoft do too. I might be wrong there. Um, nearly every studio though has some form of continuous integration system with automated overnight testing and profiling as part of their check-ins, as part of their basic development cycle. And it's really, really useful because it allows you to find problems as they happen, not after the entire studio has rolled forward doing a lot of work, which might then have to be undone. Now, if you're a small indie developer, think carefully. Um, if you have more than 10 engineers on your team, you should definitely consider doing this. It might be worth one of their time for a month to implement this system, get it nice and robust. Uh, on Android, it might be worth it just to increase the ability you're able to effectively test without massively increasing the number of testers that you need for the different devices you're testing on. And building this out, you can use this system on other platforms that you're targeting too. There's no reason it's just for Android. So it has, in my opinion, benefits at every single stage of development, and it's easily worth it. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I reserve the right to say I have no idea. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to please come up to the mic, uh, feel free. But otherwise, thank you very much. feel it, somebody's thinking about answering, uh, uh, asking a question. <laughs> there we go. I got you covered. Uh, <clears throat> so as a tester, and right now looking for work, so I don't have a project to work on this kind of thing from, do you have any suggestions on how one can go about getting some experience using those tools? Um, using the tools like uh, input recording? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the most part, it should be transparent. So once you have a system like this in place, it should be as simple as uh, loading a test level, like clicking on the normal script you use to launch the game, um, and then Ideally, a script would copy this data back from the device automatically, upload it onto a server, and then automatically play it out on all of the other devices. It shouldn't really be any different to a normal gameplay session. Right. Uh, I'm more curious, are there uh, 
example projects that one could set up at home to practice and just get exposure to how to implement the things, how to trigger them? Not yet, but okay. uh, we have examples of how to use the instrumented profiler. Okay. Uh, input recording, we don't have any examples of that yet. I can definitely look into doing something like that. Okay. Uh, but there's, there's nothing there at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we'd like to see uh, middleware engines start doing more of this kind of thing in the future, if possible. Right. Um, but, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Okay, great, thank you. Absolutely. Speaking of middleware engines, <laughs> Hello. what support is there in, say, Unreal or Unity uh, to have this workflow? Uh, right now, as far as I'm aware, there is no actual direct support to do that in Unreal or Unity uh, that is available to the public. Um, there may be plugins available for Unity, I think, that allow you to do some kind of recording playback. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that I don't think is widespread in the middleware engines you can get a hold of today. Well, if nobody else has any more questions, thank you very much for your time.